Welcome back. I'm here today with Dr. Minerva Cordero, a mathematician at the University of Texas Arlington. She's currently the Senior Associate Dean of the Sciences and Professor of Mathematics. Thank you so much for sitting, us, sitting down with us virtually today. It's my pleasure, Erica. Thank you for having me. Do you remember when you first decided that you wanted to become a mathematician? Well, actually, ever since I can remember, I think I love mathematics and it came easy to me. Um, I come from a family of six children, four sisters and two brothers, and my two older sisters were very good at math. So I started learning arithmetic even before I started school. I also had two younger siblings who I helped with their schoolwork. Helping them with mathematics came naturally to me, and I developed a love for mathematics and for teaching very early on. A few years later, when I was, I think, in 10th grade, my uncle decided that he wanted to take the general education development test, the GED. Mm -hmm. However, since he had only gone to school until the fifth grade, he needed to learn all the mathematics he would need to pass the exam. So I offered to teach him. We met daily for several weeks and it was challenging actually helping someone who had never encountered mathematical abstraction. After many long hours working together, he took the exam and he passed it the first time. Um, after this experience, I was convinced that helping people learn and enjoy mathematics was going to be my lifelong endeavor. Oh, wow. So you're just a natural teacher from early on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I really enjoy teaching from very early on to this day, I still do. How did people in your life react when you first told them you wanted to be a mathematician? Were, were people generally supportive? Did you receive any pushback? Well, you know, my parents didn't attend college. Indeed, my father only completed second grade and my mother fifth grade. Their parents didn't allow them to attend school so they could help with house chores and also with family income. So my parents didn't know much about different career options. And at first, I didn't know what career options there were for someone with a degree in mathematics. I just knew I loved mathematics and I wanted to learn as much as possible. When I was finishing up college, my abstract algebra teacher, Dr. Carol Knighton, she suggested that I continue graduate studies. She said I should get a doctorate in mathematics. I didn't even know what that would entail, but I also wasn't too excited because in Puerto Rico at the time, there was no doctoral program in mathematics. So pursuing such a degree meant that I would have to leave my family and move to the U.S. This was a very difficult choice for me. However, my mother and my siblings encouraged me to do it. But there was another problem. We didn't really have the financial resources for me to move to the US to study because I come from a very humble background. However, I applied for a fellowship from the National Science Foundation, which I received. And this allowed me to come to the US to pursue a PhD in mathematics. It's really interesting that all four sisters, we all pursued careers in science and mathematics. My oldest sister, Nelda, she received a master's degree in chemistry and taught high school chemistry for 30 years. My second oldest sister, Olga, she studied mathematics as well. She received a PhD in mathematical statistics and she's a professor at the American University in Washington, D.C. My youngest sister, Lillian, studied computer science and is a librarian at the University of Puerto Rico. My two brothers, however, they pursued careers in business. So it's really interesting how from you know, my parents who did not have a college education, yet all four daughters pursued careers in STEM. Isn't wow. that wonderful? <laughs> That's incredible. I can't even imagine what your Thanksgiving dinner table conversation <laughs> <laughs> So according to your bio, it says your research is in finite geometrics and uh, forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly, uh, combinatorics. Combinatorics, uh, yes. Uh, one of those words I've never heard before. Um, <laughs> so could you just briefly describe what your research is about uh, to someone who's not in the field? Yeah, so finite geometries is a beautiful area in mathematics, and it's really at the intersection of algebra, geometry, and combinatorics. And combinatorics, in some sense, is the science of counting things. Um, you use algebraic and geometric notions and results to solve problems. I solved many problems and proved quite some interesting theorems. My research belongs to an area of pure mathematics. In mathematics, you can work either in pure mathematics or in applied mathematics. Algebra and geometry are both considered pure mathematics. However, my research has applications to many areas and have been instrumental in the development of safer mechanisms for encoding information. For example, your cell phone. When you make a call, when you send a text, there is a tremendous amount of information that needs to be sent 
to the recipient to design the safest mechanism to encode this message and then decode it so the receiver can understand it, takes a lot of mathematical formulas to create, and is part of my research. What I do in mathematics, when you look into the structures that I studied, what are some applications of that? Other applications is to store pictures in a computer or in another device. It takes a very large amount of data to store just one picture. However, if we don't design a way to use very little space in the computer, we won't be able to store many pictures. Achieving this actually requires mathematics. Just like making animated movies, you have to use mathematics for that. And there are mathematicians that actually work in Hollywood. But actually, my research also has other applications to other more serious things, like, for example, in medicine, designing a CT scan machine or an MRI machine requires tremendous knowledge of mathematics. And many of the technological advances that we have in medicine are possible or were possible because of mathematics. Right now, predicting the spread of the coronavirus requires many mathematical computations. Actually, the research of one of my colleagues in the math department at UTA is on how diseases spread. He did an excellent work a few years ago looking at the spread of the Zika virus. So mathematics impacts every aspect of one's life, and my specific area of mathematics has to do with all this type of uh, saving information, transmitting information in the safest and most efficient way. Wow, I had no idea there's so many fields. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Who would have thought? <laughs> have you um, encountered any setbacks throughout your career? And if so, how have you overcome those setbacks? Well, this is a really good question. And I've, you know, I've been thinking about it. And I always consider myself to be a very lucky person. But when I think back, when I came to the States, to the United States to study mathematics, it was very difficult um, at first for me. I realized that even though my professors at the University of Puerto Rico had done a great job in their classes, the level of instruction that I received was not comparable to what my classmates had experienced. I went to the University of California at Berkeley. This is one of the best universities in the world and especially for mathematics. So my classmates, they came from very good universities and they were the best students at their schools. So I felt very discouraged and very alienated at the time. But thinking about the sacrifices I'd made uh, leaving Puerto Rico motivated me to keep going. So it's like, I have already done this much. I need to keep going. In my career per se, once I got my PhD, I kind of don't think that I have encountered setbacks. Perhaps there are, but I just don't look at them that way. Um, I guess I'm lucky that I am talented at communicating mathematics. I'm a good teacher and actually I have received several honors uh, because of my teaching and my research has progressed very well and has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the National Security Agency and others. So I guess that what, sort of what I keep telling myself all the time is like, I've come this far why would I stop now? I need to keep going. And I guess that's kind of the way to look at when, when you face setbacks, that's kind of a way to just keep going. It's like you already came to this stage, might as well keep going. And one thing I realized, especially when I was uh, working on my PhD, uh, unfortunately, my mother, my mother passed away at that time of breast cancer when I was in the middle of my studies. And uh, I really, it was very hard for me to keep going, to find the motivation to keep going. And then again, just telling me, you already did all this. You sacrificed so much to come to this stage. You might as well finish it. And so I did. So I've noticed that you're involved in a lot of different outreach activities um, that are designed to increase the number of underrepresented minority students in mathematics. Um, so do you have any recommendations for how institutions like science museums and others uh, can do a better job at promoting diversity in STEM? It's very important that we increase the number of women and other underrepresented minorities in STEM. You know that women account for about half of the college educated workforce. So about 50% of the people with a college degree who are working, they're women. However, when you look at science and engineering, it's only 29% that are women. In, part in, in computer science and mathematics, it's 27%. Of all the number of engineers that are working out there, only 16% are women. When you look at underrepresented minorities, again, only 7% are Hispanic and 6% are African American. So a total of 13%, even though they're a much larger percentage of the population. So yes, this is something that I have spent a lot of time working with, trying to bring more people into science, into engineering, into mathematics. What I think uh, when you develop a program, it's very important to be intentional. 
in our outreach efforts. And I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I received a multi-million grant from the National Science Foundation to help improve graduate education in mathematics. And the plan was to have graduate students go to K-12 schools here in the area and communicate mathematics and the power of mathematics to students to get them excited about it. When we were deciding what schools we want to work with, we decided intentionally to work with the schools that have the highest percentage of underrepresented minorities and the largest number of students from low socioeconomic status. It could have been easier to work with another school, more affluent schools, but that's not what we wanted to do. We were intentional in what we wanted to do. So I would recommend really identifying opportunities for increasing diversity, bringing in those students into your programs and making them feel comfortable. Many a times there are programs targeting underrepresented minorities that are not successful because the circumstances and the cultural characteristics of these individuals is not taken into account. In academia, we talk about culturally relevant pedagogy. We have to be mindful and respectful of the cultural differences and make this group of students, of individuals, feel comfortable in the environment that we have created for them. I think that's key. To, be, to the success of bringing more diversity into all these different uh, fields. Thank you so much. And lastly, do you have any advice for young people who are interested in pursuing a career in mathematics or maybe just a STEM career more generally? My one recommendation is to take as much math in high school before you start college so, and to try to really do well in those courses. You don't have to be an all-A student, and this is something I tell them. You don't have to be an all-A student to study math, to study science, to be an engineering. Um, and also, don't worry about getting to advanced math, uh, to say to calculus when you are in high school. It's very important that you learn your algebra too. It's very important you do geometry, your pre-calculus. For example, my high school didn't have any math classes beyond algebra too. So I, when I started college, that's when I took pre-calculus. And I took my time to learn pre-calculus and then calculus one. And I caught up with all my classmates that were from more affluent schools and came with calculus too. So really take the time to learn the basics. Mathematics, science, STEM, it's for everyone. If you set your mind to do it, you will succeed. If you spend time with the subject, it will become so much clearer and you will actually enjoy it. Yes, mathematics is actually fun. And knowing that math can actually help so many problems in our world and it plays such an important part in all technological developments makes it really a great area to study. So just spend the time with the mathematics uh, in school and once you get to college you're going to have a much better time in your science your engineering courses and you're going to really be successful and have a very fulfilling career well thank you so much for that great advice and thank you again for uh, taking the time to speak with us today dr cordero we really appreciate it um and um if anyone wants to follow you or the work you do is there a place they can do that Yes, absolutely. Well, my website at UTA, I do keep a lot of information, but the If Then Ambassadors program that I was selected to be an ambassador, uh, we have our own website in there and we have a lot of activities and things for young students uh, to see about what it is like to be a scientist, to be a mathematician. So look under Cordero or, or Minerva Cordero and you will find lots of information and fun stuff to do. Okay, great. And we'll be sure to link your bio so they can just easily click. So below this video, just click on over and you'll be able to see Dr. Cordero's profile. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erica. This has been wonderful. You have a wonderful day and everyone, thank you so much for participating, for listening. All right.